specifically in remedial courses and specifically in math, and we all know that math can prove to be a significant barrier to student success. So this is, a, this is an intervention and a strategy that works. And so let me link that in a second to designing for success. So as you know, we've been discussing all year stage one, uh, phase one of our strategic planning process, which is designing for success. We've had over 180 people, uh, faculty and staff and students, engaged in five working groups around designing for success and three subcommittees of our equity and inclusion task force. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I'm a little blurred on the time, but I think it was a couple of weeks ago, we had three student forums and had really, really good uh, student uh, uh, turnout, about 75 students per times three, whatever that equals. So that's really solid in terms of um, student input on what it takes to improve student success. So all of that, that's a heavy dose of qualitative data, obviously, and so all of that is being analyzed right now by our Office of Institutional Effectiveness and Analytics. Um, we've also been working through that office throughout the year to really dig deep into some of our key issues in terms of student success, um, specifically why our retention rates are going down, why we continue to have stubborn equity gaps, particularly for black and Hispanic males at all transition points along the way. Um, and why we have so many students on probation. So we've been really studying those deeply and trying to better understand that. So during this year, again, these working groups have been working. Um, their end of year reports are due at the end of June, um, and those will help us frame what we do for phase two of strategic planning, um, which will take place next year, culminating in the publication of our 2020-2025 strategic plan in this spring. And so what we're trying to do right now is frame up what that's going to look like for next year based on what's happened this year, based on what's happened in the working groups, based on the quantitative analysis we've been doing, based on the qualitative analysis we've been doing. And so the, the, the framing idea right now for designing success phase two is about taking what works to scale. So we know, for example, and you know this, that students in cohort programs do better than those who are not in cohort programs. We know that students are in ASAP, are in BMCC Learning Academy, College Discovery, EDGE, out and two, any of those cohort program students are much more likely to graduate in timely fashion. In fact, often have doubled the graduation rates of our overall population. Right now, about 30% of our students are in one of those programs, so the question for us is how do we get to 100%? And one of the things that's good news is that we've changed the notion from a cohort program to a cohort experience, because now we're starting to get evidence that any kind of experience, including this kind of experience, which really is a cohort experience, it's not, it's not the heavy ASAP model that, that all of that, that includes, but it is an opportunity for students to engage deeply um, with peers and deeply with faculty. And we have a really interesting and I think important evaluation of peer mentoring that just came out from the Office of Institutional Effectiveness and Analytics, which shows the dramatic impact of peer mentoring for both the mentors, um, which is perhaps not as um, surprising given that they're highly motivated students, but also for the mentees in terms of retention and graduation rate. So thinking about how, how can we get every student, and particularly every new student, in some kind of cohort experience, that's going to be one of our challenges for next year. 
So in terms of bringing things to scale, these are what we're thinking about right now. Improving the experience for incoming students, so that's going to be a direct thread from the work that's being done right now. Um, if you've read up on some of that work or some of you may be participating in that, you know that currently it can take up to 22 steps for students to get registered. That is, they have not even stepped foot in a class yet. And so students drop off because they just can't deal with that. So how do we streamline that and make that a better experience? Again, for all students, the, the notion here, and this is a challenge for a resource challenge, it's a logistic challenge, it's a facilities challenge at BMCC, but we have to press ourselves to try to figure out what it would take. So that's one. The second, as I already um, mentioned, is increasing participation in the cohort experience. Uh, the third is improving learning in the first year pedagogy and support. Um, things underway like looking at the new, uh, new student orientation, looking at the creation of a credit-bearing first semester course. So there's a group of faculty ex um, exploring that concept right now. Looking at what it means to have culturally, culturally relevant and active pedagogy in all of our classes. I was just at um, AACC, some of us were there and went to a session on the power of the first day of class and what should happen in the first day of class in terms of retention and success. And so it's thinking about that. How can we really work with faculty to improve the student experience in class and out? Um, the next one is improving learning through um, integrated academic support services, and that's where supplemental instruction lives. So looking at things like advisement, tutoring, supplemental instruction, the early alert, but we also have a great evaluation of tutoring that came out maybe a year ago now, or time goes by quickly, um, which again gives us evidence that we know that if students go to tutoring, they do better. I mean, it's sort of self-evident, but now we have the evidence that we need. So we also know that um, there's a selection bias in some of this research in the sense that students who go to tutoring are more motivated. But the question then becomes for us in terms of going to scale is how do we support those kind of academic behaviors for all students? Um, the, I think I'm on the fourth area, integrating career development throughout the student experience. So that's been a push this years to figure out how we can provide for students from the front end an opportunity for career exploration, development, and preparation, again, for all students. Now, this is a very heavy lift. So we have a career services office that has about nine staff members for 26,500 students. So how to bring that to scale is a huge question. And I know this is um, a matter of some debate for some students, but I mean, sorry, for some faculty, um, but students tell us that they want to have a career that's meaningful for them, that can transform their lives, that can transform their families' lives. So I feel like we owe it to them to provide that opportunity. Um, the next one is strengthening our culture of care for students, faculty, and staff. Um, CUNY just did an assessment of community college students and found some very alarming rates of food insecurity and housing insecurity and homelessness among community college students. We also know that we can't care for our students if we're not caring for ourselves. So how do you create that culture of care? That's an important area. And then the final one that's emerging is strengthening BMCC's role in a thriving New York City and as a leading community college uh, nationally. And things that might fit into that, that area include um, things like service learning. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing is throughout this year is really looking at our mission statement and saying, are we achieving this mission statement? So one of the things in that mission statement is preparing students for careers. And so when I, when we have the debate about the extent to which we should do career development, it's right in our mission statement that we're going to do that. Another piece that's in our mission statement is uh, preparing students for lifelong learning and civic participation. And so figuring out the extent to which we're really achieving that uh, is important and figuring out how service learning fits into that. So that's sort of where we are. Um, we have actually have a um, Design for Success steering committee meeting this Friday. And then as I said, we will, um, the working groups, all eight of those working groups will be submitting year-end reports. We'll put those up on the web. Um, and then over the summer, we have to figure out how to frame this thing up. What I imagine will happen is we'll have a steering committee, we'll have uh, co-chairs of each of these goal areas, so we'll have one faculty member, one staff, probably a cabinet sponsor that's not the co-chair, but that just checks in periodically. Um, and then I imagine we'll have an all call um, like we have before. We did for middle states and we did for the previous strategic planning process, which is, do you want to be on one of these subcommittees? Um, this year has been 
uh, organic, shall we say, a little bit messy. As I said, the 180 people have been involved. Some of these subcommittees have 50 people on them. I mean, I went, I went to the first year uh, meeting once, and they had to meet in uh, the Richard Harris Terrace because it was the only room I could meet in. So we're not going to have groups that big. We will definitely have focus groups and opportunities for uh, faculty, staff, and students to participate, but we're going to need a little more tightly organized um, committee structure in order to actually write the report, uh, write our strategic plan. So that's where we are. I think it's really exciting. Um, you know, again, we don't know exactly where we're going to land on this, and I really appreciate everyone who's been involved. A lot of feedback. It's still a lot of conversation. I'm sure at the end, next academic senate, there'll be a lot more conversation. I welcome that. I welcome any feedback. Um, we certainly welcome your participation. And thanks for being here because this is, as I said, a central strategy in, in terms of dramatically improving student success, which is our goal, doubling our graduation rate. So questions, comments, thoughts? Good seeing you all. <laughs> Have a good day. Thank you.